Aloha. <clears throat> Welcome to the second half of lecture number 14. Um, in the first half, we talked more about uh, the development of the internal structures of the face and the throat and so on. Uh, this half of the lecture, we're going to talk a lot more about how the actual face itself is formed. So let's tackle the face. Um, oh, goodness, am I on the right page of my notes here? Yeah, we're good. Now, uh, it's important to remember that most of the tissues of the face and mouth are derived from mesenchyme. It's also important to remember that most of the mesenchyme in the face and the mouth was derived from neural crest cells. I'm going to repeat that because it might appear on a quiz someday, just in case it does, so that you have a chance to write it down. Most of the mesenchyme of the face and mouth is derived from neural crest cells. Now, there is a lot going on here. So let's see if we can break it down and make it digestible and understandable. <clears throat> um, so the first thing we need to understand is that the first pharyngeal arch develops two prominences that sort of split it into two halves um, around the stomodium. Uh, so this is a view from the front and a view from the side so you can kind of see, right? So here's the two prominences on the left pharyngeal arch and two prominences on the right pharyngeal arch, uh, first pharyngeal arch, right? So this is a sagittal section and you can see, so here's the first pharyngeal pouch, right? So all of this is all the first pharyngeal arch. So you can see it's one big arch that kind of has two big humps on it or two big flaps, right? So this is the maxillary prominence and the mandibular prominence, okay? Um, and then, yeah, we got all the, the heart, the forebrain, all the other stuff on the slide. That's really not so important. Um, but anyway, so, but you've got one of these on each side, right? So one, two, three, four, and that basically forms four primary centers of development for the face. Now you can kind of see from this picture, it looks like, you know, the <clears throat> mandibular prominence is is way outgrowing everything else. So really the first structure in the face that kind of forms is this lower jaw, right? These two prominences are gonna grow and fuse together in the middle and you're gonna end up with a lower jaw. Uh, there's this other developmental center right above it called the frontonasal prominence, which is all this area in green right here, the frontonasal prominence. So altogether, that makes five primary developmental centers for the face, right? So we have the um, left and right mandibular prominences, the left and right maxillary prominences, and the frontonasal prominence. Okay. Um, that might be on the quiz too. It might be worth remembering that there are five primary developmental prominences for the face five primary developmental prominences for the face. Um, now, like I said, this, uh, these mandibular prominences are gonna be the first ones that grow out. They're gonna meet in the middle, they're gonna zip together, and that's gonna form the lower jaw and the chin. Interestingly enough, um, a cleft chin is actually a failure of these two to fully fuse together the way that they're supposed to, which I think is interesting because Everybody thinks that that cleft chin or that dimpled chin is so very, very handsome, but it's actually a defect. It's a handsome defect, I guess. Now, uh, the nasal, <clears throat> frontal nasal prominence is gonna grow down in front of the maxillary prominences, right? So you can't see it, but this maxillary prominence, right? Uh, it grows up here and they kind of meet in the middle up here. The right and the left sides kind of meet in the middle up here on the other side of the stomodium. And uh, you just can't see it because the frontal nasal uh, prominence grows over the top of it. Okay. You've also got these things inside here that are, uh, you know, this thing called the forebrain. And on either side of the forebrain, you've got these optic vesicles. And over the top of the optic vesicles, you have this lens placode that is developing, right? 
So these are more on the front. The lens placoid at this stage of the game is like right on the side of the head over here, like straight facing sideways. <laughs> Weird looking critter at this stage of the game we are. <clears throat> um, so anyway, as the maxillary process and the mandibular uh, prominences are growing, you see these two other prominences starting to appear on the on either side of the frontonasal prominence, right? You see them starting to appear over this nasal placode, right? It starts out as a thickening, which is the placode part, and then pretty quick, um, you start to have these right and or these medial and lateral sides of this um, nasal prominence, and then the center starts to kind of hollow out into a pit called the nasal pit. Right, so we've got the lateral and medial nasal prominences and the nasal pit in between them, and they kind of meet down here at the bottom. Right, so um, as the nasal prominences and pits develop, uh, the maxillary the maxillary prominences begin to proliferate and grow and get bigger. As this happens, these two guys bump into each other, the nasal pit. Or sorry, the nasal prominence and the maxillary prominence bump into each other, forming this groove at the uh, in between them called the nasolacrimal groove. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, but anyway, this maxillary prominence is going to continue to grow and it's going to push these, uh, these nasal prominences towards the midline. As it grows, it's going to actually physically push them over. And as that happens, this guy's growing, this guy's growing, this guy's growing, and they're all like rubbing against each other like tectonic plates. And what happens is the mesenchyme of all three of these structures start to become mixed and mingled. And as this stuff mixes and mingles and overlaps as it rubs together, you form this cheek and you form this upper lip and uh, and, and this nose from all these tissues that are pushing against each other and kind of fusing together and intermingling as they go. Um, yeah, so by the end of it, you have uh, a cheek and an upper lip and a lower lip and a nose that are all kind of made of this mingled tissue on the surface, okay? Um, now, um, remember what I told you, we we're going to talk more about this nasolacrimal groove. So what happens is the surface ectoderm, right, which they also call the epithelium in the book, um, but I'm going to be more specific than that. The surface ectoderm of this area begins to proliferate and it starts to grow inside that groove and it invaginates in there and it eventually forms this solid rod of uh, ectoderm tissue, of epithelial tissue inside that groove. And as this guy closes together and zips up, that rod of tissue is going to hollow out in the middle uh, via apoptosis, and that's going to form a tube between the eyelid and the nasal cavity, right? And that is called the nasolacrimal tube. And that nasolacrimal tube that connects the eyelid to the nasal cavity is why when you cry, your nose starts running like crazy. Um, so anyway, once it's all said and done, you end up with something like this, right? This is my daughter, um, Lucy. My daughter, Lucy, she's my second daughter. Isn't she darn cute? I mean, this is right after she was born. She got a lot cuter than this uh, <laughs> a couple weeks later. She looks a little beat up, actually, in this picture. But anyway, this is my daughter, Lucy, when she was just a brand new newborn. Uh, and you can see we've got the nose and the upper lip <clears throat> and the chin and the jaw and the cheek and all of this is completed and zipped together and fused and intermingled. And you end up with this really adorable thing at the end of it. Um, and we're not really... Um, they're going to discuss the formation of the nasal cavities too much. Uh, there really isn't much to say. You know, the nasal cavity, it starts out as a pit. The pit gets really deep. It gets really big. It gets really funny shaped. It starts to join with other tissues. And voila, you have a nasal cavity. We are, however, going to talk a little bit about the formation of the palate. 
Now, the reason we're going to go over this is because there are a lot of different pieces and parts that are all coming together. And because of that, it's a place where things go wrong a little more often, just because there's a lot of moving parts that are all coming together. All right, so here's how it goes. Um, you start with this, um, okay, just to get you oriented, just to get you oriented, this is um, so we're looking into the roof of the palate from underneath, right? So we're looking at the top of somebody's mouth from underneath. So these are the, the gums of the top jaw that were, you know, what are eventually going to, the top teeth are going to eventually grow out of here. And then this is the upper lip. And then this is the tissue that is eventually going to zip together and form the palate. This is the nasal septum, right? Uh, so anyway, what you see, uh, uh, and basically all of this is formed from um, that, maxillary prominence of the first pharyngeal arch okay so you've got this um maxillary prominence sorry both maxillaries there's, there's one on each side so you have the maxillary prominences of the pharyngeal arch and as these guys zip together in the middle you start to form this little bulge of tissue out the back of it called the median palatine process um, also called the primary palate they use those terms pretty well in in your interchangeably within the book so primary palate, median palatine process are the same thing. Then what happens at the same time is you have these two lateral um, growths. And, and this is all mesenchyme, by the way. So this is an outgrowth of mesenchyme, a proliferation of mesenchyme. These are also proliferations of mesenchyme tissue. Um, but anyway, these two lateral pro uh, prominences are called uh, the lateral palatine processes or the secondary palate. Uh, so these... Uh, this median palatine process, it never really gets very big. These guys are going to outgrow it. They're going to meet in the middle right on the top of it, as you can see here. And then what's going to happen is those median uh, or lateral palatine processes are going to meet in the middle and zip together from the front to the back, right? So this would be the, the ventral side towards the dorsal side. Oops. Right, so it zips together from the front towards the back and eventually fuses all the way together, all the way through the uvula. Yes, your uvula actually starts in two pieces and yes, it can not fully fuse so that people are sometimes born with a split uvula and it looks really weird. They open up, they say, ah, and their uvula is hanging in two pieces. I've seen it before. <laughs> it looks very interesting. Uh, but anyway, uh, what's gonna happen then is part of this palette is going to ossify. And the way that it ossifies, in fact, the way that all of the maxillary bone and the mandibular bone, the um, <clears throat> maxilla and the mandible all form by um, intramembranous bone formation. So it's important to notice that there is never any cartilage in these structures. This is all soft tissue. And then that soft tissue, uh, part of it ossifies through intramembranous bone formation. The back part of the palate never does ossify. It stays soft. That is your soft palate. Uh, but this front part of the palate does ossify and that so and I've said it a couple times, which should indicate its importance. Okay, so I'm going to say it one more time so that you can write it down. There is never any cartilage formed in the palate. Never any cartilage formed in the palate. It is all intramembranous bone formation, no cartilage. Right. And again, only the front part of the palate ossifies, the back part stays soft. Now, lastly, we're going to borrow some material from chapter 17, and we're going to talk very briefly about the development of the eye. We're not going to go into any great depth of detail, uh, but we're just going to hit the highlights. Now, remember way back when there was this structure forming called the neural tube, the embryo hadn't quite folded yet. We had open neuropores at the top. Of course, they cut the bottom half off, but there would be an open neuropore down here as well, right? So up here at the top, there's this structure called the forebrain. And in the forebrain, you start to see these grooves forming, right? These impressions forming. These are eventually going to become those optic vesicles, right? So then what's gonna happen is this is, good. the embryo is gonna fold. So this is gonna end up down here and um, this neuropore is going to close, the rest of this is going to zip the rest of the way together, and you're going to end up with a forebrain made of neural tube tissue and these two optic vesicles sticking out the side, okay? 
Now, we talk about the optic vesicles being there, but we never talk too much about what happens after that, right? Um, so yeah, anyway, just to make sure that you guys are oriented. So we have the forebrain here. We have, um, you know, the midbrain. So this is all neural tube tissue. This outer layer here, this is surface ectoderm. This is the skin, okay? Surface ectoderm, and then everything in between those two is all mesenchyme, right? So all this pink stuff, this is all mesenchyme tissue, um, just so that you know where we're at, all right? So what happens is um, we have the forebrain, we have the optic vesicles, and then we have the skin, and over top of the optic vesicles, the skin starts to thicken. The surface ectoderm starts to thicken. And this forms a structure, a structure called the lens placode. Now, as this um, embryo continues to grow, uh, this um, proximal side of this, the, the bottom of this optic vesicle, the back part of it is going to become longer and skinnier. Now, it's going to narrow into something called the optic stock. It's important to remember here, though, that narrowing doesn't actually mean getting, getting skinnier. Narrowing means that everything else is growing faster than it, so it appears more narrow relative to everything else, right? So this isn't actually getting skinnier. It's just that this is getting bigger faster than that's getting bigger. So anyway, the op uh, um, it lengthens and narrows into the optic stock. As that happens, the optic vesicle begins to form a cup shape. Right now, as the lens placode continues to thicken, of course, it doesn't thicken evenly. It thickens more around the edges than in the middle, and this forms a pit, the lens pit. What's going to happen is, as the cup deepens, as the optic cup deepens, that lens pit is also going to deepen a lot until it becomes a vesicle. Then that vesicle is going to detach altogether, and you've got this piece of surface ectoderm floating around in the middle of the eye. Right, so notice what we've got here. We've got the optic cup, which is going to ultimately become the retina, which is made out of neural tube tissue. And then we have the lens of the eye, which is made from this stuff, which is surface ectoderm. So retina, neural tube, lens, surface ectoderm guarantee you that will be on the quiz and it will also i think be on the final exam okay so definitely write that down the retina is derived of neural tube tissue the lens is derived of surface ectoderm tissue okay now once we have the lens formed uh, then the chamber that the lens exists in right this chamber right here is going to enlarge it's going to get bigger and as it gets bigger it's going to fill up with vitreous so, um, tissue. And this vitreous tissue is, you know, it's kind of a jelly-like substance. Um, then what you're gonna see is in front of the lens of the eye in this mesenchyme, you're gonna start to see uh, some holes form, some hollow spots form. Guess how they form? You guessed it, apoptosis. And as this, uh, and as this hollows out, this is going to eventually get bigger. This hollowing is going to get bigger and it's going to become the anterior chamber eventually. Okay. Um, now you have this inner layer of the retina here, and then you have this outer layer of the retina here, right? Now this inner layer of the retina is ultimately going to become, um, it's going to differentiate into specialized photosensitive cells that allow us to see, right? This outer layer is going to differentiate into pigment forming cells and it's going to become the pigmented part of the retina that you can actually see uh, when you look into the eye before it creates that nice red background. Of course, some of that is because of a lot of blood vessels back there. But anyway, uh, yeah, so this is going to become the pigment part of the retina and this is going to become the neural part of the retina and eventually these guys, as you can see down here, are going to attach together nice and firmly, eventually. Um, other stuff that's going on, you'll notice that this, right, oops, sorry, I went, 
Uh, this is the ret or the iris of the eye. The iris of the eye, if you'll notice, is formed from the same tissue that forms the optic cup that forms the retina. And as we discussed in previous chapters, the retina of the eye is formed. It's, it's one of the only pieces of smooth muscle in the body that are formed from neural tube tissue, right? Um, this mesenchyme that lives out here, um, it starts to form the sclera. The sclera is the white fibrous part of the eyeball. And, uh, and then of course, you know, mesen a combination of mesenchyme and surface ectoderm ends up forming the cornea and the eyelids, which then close together and fuse um, and all that good stuff. And eventually you end up with this uh, fully formed eyeball. Okay. Uh, and that's really about it for the eye. That about covers it. Um, now, as far as the ear goes, we've really mostly discussed how it develops already. Uh, the only thing that we didn't discuss that I do want you to know is that the external auricle develops from cartilage derived from the first and second pharyngeal arches. So some of that cartilage uh, ends up forming the, the external ear, the auricle of the ear. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So in, you know, uh, a couple of videos, a couple of short videos, we have gone from this to that. <laughs> and I really think that is one of the most incredible things in the world that, and you know, in, in real time, we're talking about, um, you know, this is like four weeks, you know, and, or, you know, somewhere between four and 25, 20, this is, this is probably like a 26 day embryo. So what is that? Almost, uh, almost seven weeks. Uh, and then, we end up with this by the time the baby's born. It's just an incredible transformation to me how that happens. Um, so if you're curious, this is my, um, my youngest daughter, Eliza. Uh, she's being held by her older sister, my oldest daughter, uh, Zion, who's, you know, I can tell by the lovely golden locks <laughs> and the cute little skinny arm. But anyway, yep, so this is my uh, youngest daughter, Eliza, being held by her older sister. Uh, and that's it. So we have developed a face on a person in, uh, in just a few short weeks' time. If you have any questions or you need anything clarified or there's anything you want to know more about, please, by all means, write it down, jot it down, bring those questions with you on Thursday to the Zoom meeting. Um, of course, there's going to be a review for the exam. It'll definitely be worth being there. Uh, even though I give a lot of cues and clues throughout the lecture, the review is still worth being there for because, I mean, I don't know, I see it in the scores. The guys that come to the review are outscoring the guys that don't. So please come to the review, ask me some intelligent questions, see if you can stump me so everybody can get extra credits. And uh, <clears throat> I guess that's about it. Have a great weekend. Study hard for the quiz. Aloha.